good morning, everybody. So today we're going to continue talking about, I'm far too loud today. We're gonna continue talking about Java objects. Um, we'll, that is better. So we'll see how far we get today. Uh, we, over the next sort of week or so, we're gonna introduce some new object-oriented ideas and concepts, and then um, you know, it's, at some point, we're gonna start to do more practice with actually using Java objects to model uh, real entities. But I have to um, start lecture with um, an apology, because, as people have noticed, um, the midterm was hard, maybe overly difficult. Um, and, and that's entirely my fault, um, and I will take full responsibility for that. Um, you know, it's, it's easy sometimes um, for us to get a little bit out, you know, as they say, over our skis in terms of what you guys can do, uh, particularly in this kind of environment. This is not something, this type of question at this point in the class is not something that we've done before, so we're still sort of calibrating things. We're still sort of, you know, getting a sense of, you know, what you guys are capable of and what you're not capable of in this setting, okay? I, you know, and I, I'm really, you know, I'm not saying this to pacify you. Um, I'm saying this because I'm, I'm worried about one thing. I'm not really, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how to interpret how you did, um, because there is data in this assessment that we can use to start a conversation about kind of where you are in the class, and that's really useful. I'm also not worried about your grades in the class. And I know, it's easy for me to not worry. I'm the one giving the grades rather than the one receiving the grade. Um, but, you know, trust me when I say this. Um, this one difficult assessment is not gonna ruin your grade in the class. It didn't, you know, lower your letter grade by half a point or by a full point or whatever. It's just not how we do grading in this course. What I'm worried about, so let me, I'm gonna tell you a story, and the story's about um, this guy. Um, so believe it or not, I have no idea why he's wearing this. This was one of the few <laughs> photos of him I could find online. Um, but, but he's a professor of mathematics at the University of New Mexico. And when I was a freshman, he was my professor. I took, for some reason, I got to college, like many of you do, and I had thought I was smart. I had, like, always done well in my classes. I had taken all the hard math courses at my high school, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm prepared to take this difficult math course. And actually, I didn't take the most difficult math course at Harvard. I took the second most difficult math course. So I was like, I'll take it easy, you know? Um, and so Mike Nakamai was my professor, and he was, you know, I'm, I'm still talking about him now almost 20 years later. He was a really fantastic person, fantastic human being. Um, he lectured in outfits that were not that dissimilar to this. Um, although, again, I really have no idea what he's wearing in this photo. It's very confusing. Um, but he had an incredible passion and enthusiasm for the subject. He spent a lot of time with us. You know, he would do things, I'm, I don't really want to tell you too many stories about him because it's gonna start making me look bad. Um, because, you know, he would do things like organize capture the flag games for the class in, in, in Harvard Yard. And then, you know, there would be confused tourists standing there while this, like, you know, professor, I guess, maybe they just thought he was some crazy old person, uh, you know, was like running across Harvard Yard at a full sprint, you know, screaming at the students, you know, tagging somebody and then running away, right? Uh, so he, he, was a really, he was a really great guy. Um, but one of the stories that I've, things I've never forgotten about him was that in the first semester of the class, um, or maybe it was the second semester, I can't remember, but he gave us a midterm about halfway through the class, and it was a, you know, I don't know how many people have done theoretical mathematics, but this was a timed midterm. It was three hours long. And in retrospect, I, I remember, you know, we all talked about this afterwards, that the course staff, I think, had saw this exam and was terrified uh, for our behalf. And actually, they held some review sessions right before the midterm. They were kind of animated by this sense of panic among the TAs, because I think they were like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be uh, a bloodbath. Um, and it was. It was 120, if I remember correctly, it was a 120-point exam. The median was a 32. Um, it was open book and open note. I'm not making this up. And I remember sitting there about 20 minutes into the exam with really nothing left to say about the material and just reading the textbook. 
thinking like, maybe this will help, right? It's a little bit too little too late, obviously. Um, but I didn't do very well on that assessment. Nobody did. You know, again, I, I remember there was somebody who came in like two hours late for the test. Um, I sh actually just looked him up this morning because I was wondering what happened to him. And I think he got kind of the same grade as everybody else did because just nobody knew how to do this particular midterm. It was really, really difficult. So I walk back to my dorm, and before I even get back to my computer, because this was before we had, everyone had a phone and everything, to check my email, there's an email from Mike. And, you know, he acknowledged that the fact that the midterm was too hard. Okay? And, you know, obviously he said all the same things that I'm saying about this is not going to have an impact on your grade, et cetera, et cetera, which is all true. But the thing he said that was really meant a lot to me, and I'm still thinking about now, and the reason I'm telling this story, and the reason I'm worried about this midterm, is he said, I hope that this midterm hasn't affected your enthusiasm for mathematics. I hope that I haven't somehow, you know, harmed your joy about this subject. You know, because again, it's one thing to give a hard test, that's fine. It's another thing if this causes some of you to give up or get discouraged. And I know that that's sort of a natural byproduct. And so I'm here to say, you know, that's the number one thing I'm worried about this particular assessment. It's one of the reasons we're talking about it at length today. So the fact that it was hard, fine. Now that affects everybody equally. But I really don't want you to give up. I don't want you to stop trying. If you've been trying and you did kind of just okay in this midterm and you're wondering, like, is this for me? Um, you know, I hope that this assessment you know, this flawed assessment that we have unleashed on you has not harmed your appreciation for this topic, for this subject. I really hope that that hasn't happened. Okay? All right, enough about Mike. Um, a metaphor for this class. So, you know, one of the reasons, you know, maybe the one of the reasons that midterm was a little too hard is that we're really excited about teaching you this material. So I, just for fun today, because I thought it was useful to have this conversation, I wanted to show you a couple of you know, things that I consider sort of a metaphor for this class. So here's one. I don't know how many people have recognized this or have seen this before. Um, so this is a piece of conceptual art uh, by a very famous American artist, who I will name in a minute. Um, and, you know, so the idea behind this is that there's a ladder. You go up to the ladder and you walk up the ladder, and at the top you can see there, it might be hard to see, um, there's a magnifying glass. And the idea is you, walk to the ladder, you walk up the ladder, you pick up the magnifying glass, and on the ceiling, in tiny, 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 tiny print, is written something. And so you walk up, you take the magnifying glass, you look up at the ceiling, and you have this experience of, of finding out what the artist wanted you to see. And so this class is kind of like this. Our ladder is a lot taller than that, right? It goes up and up and up. And so my job is to kind of try to keep you guys moving up Right? Keep trying, keep going up the ladder. Because I know what's at the top. I know what's at the top. Um, and even if you don't, even if it's hard to see until you get up there and you start to realize it, and this may happen a lot later for some of you, I know what is at the top of this ladder. The top of the, la so the word on the ceiling is yes. It will work. Like you guys will get this stuff if you keep trying. The artist, by the way, Anybody know? Yoko Ono. And in fact, this was the piece, the legend has it, that, called jo that caused John Lennon to fall in love with Yoko Ono. He went to the show, he, he went through this, and this was sort of the beginning of their relationship. So if you credit her for breaking up the Beatles, you can blame this particular piece of art for doing it. Um, but she was an incredibly famous artist in her own right. So let me show you another one of her works. And now I want to talk about grading in the class. So this is my metaphor for grading in this course. Now some of you are going to take this the wrong way. It's like this is super confusing and nobody ever knows what's going on, right? But the idea here is that if this is a competition, there's no adversary. This is not a zero-sum game. You know, the more everyone in this class learns, the more you all learn. You're not competing with each other for that. There's an unlimited amount of computer science knowledge out there in the world for you to find and to take. And so, the only competitor here is you. There's no other team. Your opponent is not someone else in this class who's gonna prevent you from getting the grade that you deserve. Your opponent is not a particular assessment. Your opponent is not me or the course staff. You don't have an opponent. It's just you. 
you know, how hard can you work? How hard can you, you know, play and compete against yourself? That's how grading for this class works. As I pointed out, and I will say this again, your grade in this class is entirely determined by you. It's nothing to do with what anyone else in the class does. I can give everybody in this room an A. I can do that. If you guys earn it, you'll get one. There is no limit. I don't, you know, if, if 95% of the people in this class came out with A's and knew their stuff and went on and sort of barnstormed the gates of computer science at this university, I would be thrilled. You know, I am not, has been claimed, a gatekeeper. I am the person who's trying to arm you guys to crash the gates here. If you want to find out who the real gatekeepers are, I'll be happy to tell you. Come to my office hours and we'll talk about it. I'm not saying it on camera. It's not me, right? Okay. So let's talk about actually how to interpret your performance on the midterm. It's a nice, I mean, the good thing about a hard exam is that there's actually a lot of um, space here in terms of, uh, the exam has a lot of resolution. At this point, I would mainly consider how you did on the programming portions of the exam. That's my gauge at this point. Later in the class, there's gonna be conceptual material that's gonna be more important to understand, but for now, what we're doing are the programming pieces. Okay, so if you got all the programming questions correct, I will be in touch about teaching the class later in the semester. All right, um, you know, that, that's, that's a really impressive result. If you got three out of four, you did really well. Quite, quite well, right? I mean, this, this, is a, this is a really good score. Two out of four, you're doing okay. But this is what you have to do to succeed in this class. Whatever you're doing, how many hours of practice it took to get to that point, this is what you have to keep up and maintain for the next two months to, to get out of here with a good grade and with the knowledge that you need to succeed in classes later in the program. Okay? If you got one of the problems correct, we need to have a conversation about how you're approaching preparing for the midterm and for success in this course. And that's something I'm happy to have with you individually. We can have it on the forum. You know, one of the things that I've been doing now when I interact with students is I've been looking up how much time you guys have spent on the homework problems that we published. And there are people that struggled on the midterm, were angry about that, and then I went and looked and they had done zero of the homework problems. Those are there for a reason. They're there to help you prepare. It's an exam. I mean, you need to do a little bit of work to prepare for, okay? If you didn't get any of the programming questions, I'm worried, and we will, you know, be reaching out to you directly, because, you know, at this point in the semester, um, this is a dangerous result, okay? We'll, well, and we'll talk about it with you. All right. Questions, concerns, the floor is open for questions about grading, questions about the exam, questions about the rest of the course. <coughs> Just take a moment here to pause. I want to hear the room. Yeah. Will we what? So my plan is to release most, if not all, of the free responses as part of the homework. So I need to just make sure today that everybody has taken the exam. I don't want to do that. Why if there's, I think everyone did. Everyone who's going to, right? Sometimes with the quizzes, the CBTF will schedule people on Friday, uh, and so we don't always do it. We'll also go over them on Monday, right? But yeah, th so the question was, am I gonna, we gonna release the free response or let you go over them in midterm, in uh, office hours? Yeah, those will be up. Um, there were variants of each question. I'm not sure I'm gonna release all of them, but I'll definitely release at least one from every category. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. So I have started holding regular office hours on Fridays from 10 to 12. Today I will be around for as much of the day as possible. I have a meeting in the afternoon, but I'll be in my office from 10 to 12, and then I think 1 to 2 and 3 to 5. Yeah, so those are on the count. Yeah, I'm sorry that it's taken me so long to get those up. It's been a kind of a crazy month for a variety of reasons, not only this class. Other questions? So yeah, if you're concerned about your performance, please come talk to me, or talk to your TA. You know, both, you know, uh, you know, either me or the TA has access to enough information to sort of give you guidance about what to do. Other questions? Yeah. Good question. So the, I think the median score in the midterm was a 70. 
Now, actually, I meant to talk about this before, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy you asked this question. So actually, so I was, like, really, you know, you may think, ah, uh, you know, this guy's a total jerk, he just writes this midterm, and then I'm at home hanging out, petting my dog, you know, whatever. No, I was actually, like, on Prairie Learn all week, like, refreshing the page, being like, how are the students doing? And then, you know, it goes down a little bit at the end, beginning of every hour, because people start to take it, and it goes up a little bit. Um, so I actually was really impressed overall with how the class did on the midterm. Um, the programming portion was a large part of the exam, and if you look at the performance of the students in the, this class, I mean, you guys actually did really well, given the circumstances. It was hard, right? But, you know, the score, it wasn't, it wasn't a 32, right? So I'm not at Mike Nakamaya levels yet. Yeah. What's that? I have no idea. Like I said, like, this is new. We have never done an assessment like this before in this class. So it's a fair question. The question was, what did I expect? I don't know. Right? I mean, th you know, assessments like this, you have to remember, you might think this is just sort of to stack rank you or something, but it's not, actually. This provides really useful information for us. So we have a sense of what do you know, right? What can we expect going forward? What are things that we still need to continue to focus on? Um, so yeah, so the answer was, I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. I, I, I will say that I did want the midterm to be a little bit easier than it turned out to be. And just my fault for not, you know, controlling the difficulty a little bit better. Yeah. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Mm hmm So we'll do, I think we'll do, like, one or two of the midterm questions on Monday in class. Yeah. The hard ones. The easy ones will be on the, on the homework. I shouldn't say easy, they were all a little tricky. But we'll go over kind of the, the last two in particular, right? Because those seem to be the ones that people struggled on more. Other questions? All right, going once, going twice. Yeah, over here. What's up? It is available on. Should be. Let's talk to the CBTF. We'll get you in today. Yeah. 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 Right here. Speak up. So it's a good question. The question is how will we be changing the exams? I don't think the format's going to be very different. Um, I think the, um, I think we'll, we'll definitely do more work and this is something I'm going to talk about with the course staff, to try to gauge difficulty before, before we release, release an exam like this, right? Um, you know, again, we're, we're walking a fine line here between, you know, exams that are, and I don't think we're anywhere close to this line, right? But, you know, I, I don't want, I, I want to find out what you know, right? That's one of the core functions of the quizzes in this class. If you do, if the class as a whole does particularly bad on particular questions, that's a sign to us that these are things that need more reinforcement. Right, so it's something that we talk about in class. Again, we may have more homework problems again. Um, as, as far as future midterms, like, those we will definitely think harder about later. Yeah. The nice thing is, once we start to talk about objects, you know, the amount of code you have to write is smaller. Right, it requires a little bit more conceptual understanding. Um, but I also think, at some point, you guys are gonna have had enough practice with this um, that you'll get better at it. Right, but it's something that we'll keep an eye on. Again, my, my goal is to write assessments that are challenging, provide us with data about how you're doing, but are not discouraging. Balcony. Is that somebody, I think that's someone who's just holding their hand up in the air, like an antenna for some reason, okay. Other questions? Okay, so, let's talk about some computer science for the next 20 minutes. So I just wanna, I'm just gonna briefly review access modifiers, and I think we'll at least get through static today. We'll come back and talk about this more on Monday. So if you remember, on Wednesday, we talked about uh, these two new keywords. And on some level, what we're doing kind of for the next couple lectures as we continue to talk about objects is not only start to think about design aspects of computer science, but this is also sort of like modifier bingo, because there's a billion of these modifiers in Java, public, private, static, final, 
you know, whatever, uh, protected. And we're gonna try to introduce you to all of them, most of them, um, and discuss what they mean. So last time we talked about public and private. So as a review, public variables are accessible anywhere. So anybody can modify, anyone who has an instance of a person can modify the name. In contrast, the age here can only be modified by methods that are defined on the person class. And today's homework is designed to give you some practice with, with doing this. Okay? Right, so public variable can be read or written by anyone. Private, only read or written by methods defined on that class. And this is also something that will start to become a little bit more interesting once we start to talk about inheritance next week. Functions are similar. I mean, there's no equivalent of read and write for functions, but a public function it can be called by anybody who has an instance of that class. A private function can only be called by other methods on that class. So for example, when you guys look at Javadoc, the only methods listed in there are public. You will never see a private, let's, let me put it this way. You'll never see a private method listed in the Javadoc because there's no point providing documentation for it because you can't use it. Okay, good. So there's a couple more of these and, and you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them uh, later or not at all. All right, so let's talk about getters and setters. Sorry, this is the thing that we really need to get to today so you guys can work on the homework. So this is a really common design pattern in Java, which is I don't provide public access to the variables that are defined on a class. It's very rare to have a class that actually has a public instance variable. Almost every class has some variables, some instance variables that are defined as part of it. Remember, objects are sort of bringing together state and behavior, data and algorithms. And so it's very common for objects to have, you know, a uh, private state. But it's very uncommon for me to just expose that to you using a public keyword um, so that anybody can modify. Instead, what I do is the following. I have a private instance variable here called age, and then I provide functions that are so common in Java that we have names for them. These are called setters and getters. Setters set the variable, getters get the variable. These are functions. They're not variables, but their purpose is entirely to allow public modification of the field on the class. So here, I could have just marked age as public, but instead, the design pattern is I mark age as private, and then I provide two functions. I don't have to provide both or either. Um, the first one is called set age. Set age doesn't return anything, but it sets the age. Changes, so this is a public function, so now anybody can change the age. And then I provide also a second function called get age. The getters always return the type of that instance variable and take no arguments, typically, that's, that's canonical. Um, returns the value of that instance variable. So the setter takes a single argument that's the same type of that instance variable and sets it, returns nothing. The getter returns a type that's the same as the instance variable, takes no arguments. Okay, so, you know, there's sometimes a joke that Java programmers get paid by lines of code because of how verbose the language is, right? Um, and, and this slide sort of makes that clear. So there's this question of why. Why do this? You know, you might be looking at this and saying, again, I've replaced a single public instance variable with now, you know, six lines of code, right? And I've got to write all those stupid functions, and it's a huge pain, right? You know, why write code that IntelliJ can generate for me? That just seems odd. So what's the reason for this design pattern? So the real reason here is that it provides the class with a lot more control over how its instance variables are modified. So if I just provide a public instance variable, anybody can change it at any time, and I have no idea what happened. You can just modify it directly. If I force you to call a function any time you want to change the variable or retrieve the variable, now, 
I know what's happening. And I can do things. I can do interesting things. Um, I can, so here's an example. Um, this is an extension of our first, of our person class that maintains both a first and a last name. But you'll see, here now I have a much more sophisticated setter. So what does my setter actually do? It just doesn't set the name. It actually uses that as an opportunity to extract the two parts of the name from the single string that you've provided. So this is an example. Setters can do more work. A setter is a function, it's code, you can do whatever you want in the setter. So in this case, when I set name, I'm also setting the first name and last name instance variables on this class, and then I can later retrieve them. So that's one example. The other thing is, if I want to create a read or write-only variable, and you might wonder, why would I ever create a write-only variable? And there are some reasons to do that. But certainly, read-only variables sort of make sense. We'll talk about those in a sec. I don't have to provide both a setter and a getter. I can just provide a getter. If I just provide a getter, nobody can actually modify that variable, except me, internally. So externally, somebody can just retrieve the value. So again, in this case, my first name and last name are not, there's no setter, because they're set by the set name function. There are getters. So these variables are essentially read-only. You can change them by changing the entire name, by setting a new name using set name, but you can't change the first or last name individually. All right. So let me give you another example of something like this. So we're gonna do a couple examples here. We'll see how far we get, see how much time we have. So this is a little class that we're gonna work on for the next five minutes. And the goal of this, these objects is to store some integers. And you might wonder why don't I just use an array of integers? Okay, fair enough, right? For the, but you know, I can potentially do some interesting things here. So internally, instances of this class have an array of integers that they use to actually store the values. But imagine I want to be able to allow that to change, right? So let's write the constructor for this first. So I'm gonna say storage, and then I'm going to, so when I create an instance of this class, what I need to do is tell it how many integers I wanna store. So the constructor is gonna use this information to set up my initial array. So when instances of this object get created, I have to tell it how many integers I wanna store, and the constructor uses that to initialize this private field, okay? So now, let's write setters and getters for size. So size doesn't even have to be defined here. It doesn't have to be defined as an instance variable on the class. I could if I wanted to, but instead let's do this. So let's write a set size method, and it's gonna take, you know what, I'll call this new size. What are some of the things that I might want to do in this setter? So the idea here is I've created an instance of the storage class, and let's say I started out and I said I want to hold 10 ints. But one of the reasons I'm writing this class is maybe to overcome some of the limitations of Java arrays where they can't change size. And so later, I might discover, hey, I actually wanted to store 20 ints. So I'm gonna call this set size method to change the size. So what's one thing I might want to do in this method? Remember now, I'm writing code. So what's one thing that I might want to check about the new size? Yeah. Well, I know it's an integer because it's coming in as an int, so Java gives that to me. I heard an answer over here. Yeah. Yeah, so if it's smaller, so let's say I started off with a class that held, held eight ints, and now I want it to hold four. I may not want to even allow that right? Because now I've got to throw away data, and I'm not sure which values in the array you want me to get rid of. So what I might do is I might say if new size is less than 
or equal to, because if it's equal to, I don't need to do anything. My, the current size of my array, I'm just gonna return without doing anything. So here's an example of logic inside a setter. If I just exposed the array, there'd be no way to prevent people from making it smaller or larger or whatever. What else do I need to do here if I'm increasing the size of the array? Let's say that the array had 10 items, and the person who's using this new class has now told me, oh, now I want to hold 20. What do I need to do before I can change it? Yeah. So I probably want to copy over the old values from my array into whatever new array I'm going to create. And I'm not going to do that here in interest of time. But let's say copy over uh, old values into new array. So the idea is, so again, my setter is doing work. This is what's cool about setters and getters. They can do stuff. Um, they don't just have to change an instance variable. I can write code. Let's write a getter just for fun. So the getter is gonna return the same type as the variable. What do I return here? So again, I could have an instance variable named size that I use to store the size of the array, but what else could I do? I don't have to save the size of the array. Instead, what could I return here? Yeah, just return storage.length. The nice thing about Java arrays is they know how big they are. All right, so let's play with this guy a little bit. You know, we haven't, we haven't done the interesting bit here. And we can come back to this later um, on another lecture and actually finish this if you guys want, but let's create a storage object. And let's initialize it to have four values. And then I'm gonna print off storage.getSize. And if I've done my job right, it's gonna print four. Okay, good. So let's try changing the size. So let's say storage, and first of all, let's try a valid change. Let's try to expand it to eight items. And actually here, in order to get this to work, I actually do have to do something. So I'm gonna say storage is equal to new int new size. So I'm not gonna do the copy, but I am going to modify the array that I'm storing a reference to to be a new array that has the larger size that I'm after, if the size is bigger, all right? So, okay, that worked. So now I can see that the size of my array is four. Let's try it with an in, sorry, eight after the change. Let's try it with an invalid change. Yeah. So again, setters and getters can do stuff. A getter can compute a value rather than just returning the value of a field or a, uh, an instance variable. A setter may actually do a fair amount of work internally to change other pieces of state that aren't exposed publicly. Yeah, Lorenzo. Why is the second one eight? Good question. Sorry, I'm not showing you the relevant size. So what happened here? I created a new storage class with size eight. Then when I tried to set the size to four, it said, uh-oh, my new size is smaller than the current array. I'm not gonna change it. Yeah, good question. So I hit this return statement right here. I could put a printf in here just to see. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, the, the center here is enforcing behavior. It's actually not allowing you to make the array smaller. MP3, which is coming out today, is gonna have three centers that are all related to each other. It's actually one of the parts that trips up people as they start MP3. There are three parts of the game that you have to maintain, and all three of the values have to be valid. 
when the game starts. So you're gonna have to write three setters, and in each setter, it's possible that a change to the value will invalidate values that the other setters change. So I'll let you guys figure this out on the MP. But this is, this is also common. It's also common that, you know, there's several values whose, there's several instance variables whose values are related in order for the class to have a correct set of values. And so when I change one, I've gotta make sure that the rest are set appropriately. Okay. So let me just quickly do this one. So I said before that I can only provide a setter, or a getter, sorry. So here's an instance variable that only has a getter. Now this seems ridiculous. Why would I do this? How would I ever change this value? How would I set this value? I set it in the constructor. So imagine I have a person constructor that takes an age, age value. When the object is created. So again, if I have a getter and no setter and no way to change the value, that's really uninteresting. Unless the value is being computed internally somehow, like we saw with the person class where it was computing first and last name from changes to the name. But this is also very common. You have one chance to set the variable when you create new instances of that class. And then all you can do is retrieve it. There's no way to change it. So for example, one thing that my person class could do is it could say, I only want you to tell me the age when you create the new person object. After that point, I'll compute it myself because I know when you created the person. And at that time, you told me that they were 38.2. And I know how much time has passed since then. So now when you call get age, I'll actually do a computation internally. I'll say, okay, you know, yesterday the person was 32.8, today they're 32.82 or whatever. Right? So sometimes, you know, this is another, you know, use of this type of, of uh, pattern. Right? So you see this as well. Okay. I think this is a good place to stop, take some questions about access modifiers, setters and getters. So again, today's homework, the homeworks you guys have been doing for the past couple days, I know the midterm was out, I know the midterm was depressing, um, you know, please, you know, do those homework problems. Early on, when we're talking about objects, these homework problems are critical, because we're allowing you to, like, experiment with little bits and pieces of object design patterns. MP3 is gonna be out today. All right? It's due two weeks from next Monday. Other than the final project, we are not giving you more time to work on any MP in this class. This MP is probably the most important one that we're gonna do this semester, okay? So as a result, I apologize for doing this, but I'm going to close the class with another piece of bad news. You cannot drop MP3. You can drop one of the other MPs. I am not gonna allow you to drop MP3. It is too important. You have two and a half weeks to do it. It is not a lot of code to write. That's the trick. MP4 is way more lines of code. And MP4 requires you to write fiddlier stuff, like weird loops that go backwards and forwards and stuff like that. So MP3 is not a lot of code to write, but it's conceptually important. It's conceptually critical for understanding objects. All right? Do the homework. Do MP3. Don't get discouraged. I have office hours all day today. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.